welcome back to my channel. My name's Ollie and this is Simply Stitchy and the machine we're looking at today is this one. Missing a touch and throw. Um, so there are a range of machines that were built through the 60s and into the 70s. The problem is the later models from the late 60s in and through the 70s have got a bit of a reputation for being lemons. But why is that? Why is the Singer Touch and Sew so derided? And does it actually deserve the bad press that it gets? That's the subject of today's video. Is the Singer Touch and Sew really as bad as they say? Now the Singer Touch and Sew is one of Singer's least favourite machines. It's got a few affectionate names. There's the Touch and Swear and, as you heard me say earlier, the Touch and Throw. Now being a bit of a Singer fan, I thought I'd find out why this machine has never been particularly liked. When this one came up recently in a thrift store, I knew I had to get it. Now, it's not in the best state of repair. It is missing all of its accessories and it's seen better days. But for the purposes of this video, it's gonna work a treat. Now, before we get into looking at the touch and sew in greater detail, let's write a little bit of a wrong. The touch and sew, is often mistaken for the Singer Stylist, which is this one. This is the Singer Stylist 476. This is Singer Touch and Sew 640. Um, it's also got Golden in the name as well. Now, I've put them both as close together as I can possibly get them to show the differences side by side. There's a video on my channel at the minute. I'll put a link in the description box below on the comparison between this Singer Stylist and the other Singer Stylist that I've got. That's well worth having a look at that video because you'll also see me sewing in a bit of a hurricane, which is fun. For now, the differences between these two machines are the shape. This one's quite flat, um, or thin should I say, and a little bit squarer, whereas this one, if I just move it around so you can have a look, has more of a, a rounded kind of shape. It's kind of almost reminiscent of the Singer Futura range that you can get, or you were able to get a few years ago. I think that range has actually now been discontinued. Another difference between the stylist and the touch and sew is the levers. On the stylist, they're metal. On the touch and sew, they're plastic. Another difference is if you have a look at the foot down here, on the Singer Stylist it's straight up and down. Whereas if I turn this one back round here, you'll notice that the foot has a slight slant to it. It's not straight up and down. The Touch and Sew was one of the slantomatic machines. Now there's a couple of reasons why um, having a slanted foot is useful. The first reason is it makes getting the fabric underneath a lot easier and the second reason is a lot of sewists, me included, in their eagerness to make sure they're sewing in a straight line, get in so close to see what they're doing that this take-up lever smacks you on the forehead. Trust me, I know, I've done that myself. With the slantomatic, because it brings the foot further outside of the, the line of the machine, you don't have to get in so close. It doesn't hurt so much. Another difference, this machine says stylist right there. And this one says touch and sew. The bobbin system's different too. The Singer stylist takes normal class 66 bobbins. There they are, that's a metal 66 and a plastic 66. The Singer Touch and Sew has a bobbin system all of its own. This is the bobbin from out of the Touch and Sew. It's larger on the top and it's smaller underneath. It's got little white lines going all the way round so that you can gauge how much thread to put on it. 
This is it next to the two Class 66 bobbins, just so that you can see the difference and the fact that the size is different. If I just turn them onto the side for a moment, there you go. If we take a closer look at the touch and sew bobbin for a minute, it actually comes apart. You can twist it and pull the two sections away from each other, like that. And you're left with the thread wound into a cute little circle. It's actually known as a winding place bobbin. And what you do is you get your empty bobbin, you put the small side down first, and you just slot it in the machine. And there's this little metal um, I suppose you could call it a lever that you just put down on top of the bobbin and it holds it in place. Now here's the magic. You see this little target here? This is the bobbin push button and this is what engages the bobbin winding mechanism. Now I have to read the manual to find out how to get that little target button to work because it's not exactly obvious. And that's one of the main problems with the Singer Touch and Sew. They're not very really user friendly. They're a little bit confusing. To be honest with you, the manual wasn't much better. I read the manual and it said, press bobbin push button towards you. Okay, let's just stop right there for a minute. You can't press something towards you. Pressing is pushing something either down or away from you. And even if you were to try and press it towards you, technically that's pulling. After faffing about for a bit, I discovered that this thing only moves one way. Sideways. Now, as most people, when they're sewing on a sewing machine, sit in front of it, moving something to the left isn't towards you, it's away. It does make me wonder how many new Singer Touch and Sew owners fell foul of that really weird set of directions and how many, like with this one, ended up breaking the bobbin push button because they didn't know which way to push it. But that's not the only problem with this particular bobbin setup. The way you wind it, you have your thread on the thread spool and you come down through the thread path that you would do normally if you wanted to thread the top half of the machine. In fact, you even go as far as threading the needle. And then you do something a bit strange. The end of the thread that you've got going through the noodle, the noodle, the needle, is you pull it a little bit and then you wrap it round the nut that holds the foot onto the presser bar. Now I'm sorry Singer, but if you're going to go to all the trouble of making a newfangled bobbin system, why have such a naff way of holding the threads? I mean, I can see the logic, because by winding the thread around this little nut, you're keeping it in one place. Now what you do is you put your foot on the foot pedal and you make the machine go as though you were sewing. And what it does is it winds the thread onto the bobbin. There are two slight technical hitches with that setup. Number one, you have to remember to engage the bobbin mechanism. And number two, you have to remember to wrap it round the knot because otherwise it's not going to get anywhere near the bobbin, is it? end up with a knotty noodle. Ah, 
Okay, so although it didn't do a very good job of it because, like I said, this machine isn't in the best of nick, it has wound some thread onto the bobbin and you've got a loop coming off. So basically, it's just one strand of cotton that does the top um, threading and the bobbin as well. And then once you've finished winding your bobbin, if that wasn't broken, by pushing this back into the machine, it would click that back into the normal sewing mode. Now, it wasn't just the bobbin that Singer decided to get a little bit inspirational with, with the touching. So they also decided to change out the feed dogs. Now most sewing machines, previous to the touching, say, feed dogs were made of metal with like little teeth. But for this particular model, and others like it, so they decided to try something new. They decided to try rubber coated feed dogs. Now what rubber coating does on the feed dogs, these are the feed dogs from this machine, is they make the surface of the feed dogs completely smooth. See that? No teeth. Now the idea behind that was actually pretty cool because if you've got no teeth on your feed dogs you can deal with delicate fabrics just that little bit easier um, in that they don't get crimp marks or other damage. The only problem that Singer really should have seen coming was the fact that rubber on your feed dogs in an area of a sewing machine that sees quite a bit of oil because you oil the bobbin area and that kind of thing Oil eats rubber. So over time, what was happening, and it's happened on these, is, it, you see that? You see that shiny bit poking out through the, the black? That's where the oil's eaten away at the rubber and the rubber coatings come off. Now, the issue with that is it stops the feed dogs from working. And if your feed dogs don't work, your fabric isn't pulled through um, the machine uh, and under the needle so it can sew, it just doesn't move. Now, although <laughs> these were put on quite a few machines, um, Singer finally did come round to the fact that metal feed dogs with teeth are actually the way to go. You can't actually get replacement rubber coated feed dogs anymore. Um, if you do come around to replacing the feed dogs on your touch and so you'll probably be replacing them with metal ones like sorry about that forgot where I put them these these are metal feed dogs and um, those are the rubber coated ones The 70s wasn't a great decade for, for Singer, although to be honest it wasn't a brilliant decade for many manufacturers around at the time. It was just one of those decades that were bad. With the introduction of plastic as a replacement for many metal components, it was a period in history that was marred by what I like to call plastic tosh. Everything was plastic from plastic shopping bags to TV dinner plates. It was the age of Tupperware parties and plastic gizmos, like the Ronco Buttoneer. The problem with plastic, especially plastic back in the 1970s, it used to break, it used to break easily. From my toy buckaroo that lasted long enough to buck twice one Christmas morning, to the gears inside Singer sewing machines, this, is one such gear. Now this didn't actually come out of the touch and sew to be fair, this one came out of the Singer Stylist 476. Somebody in the past changed the gears out and they left this in the little accessories drawer. There you go. And what's happened is the side has broken off. Now this is a modern gear. You can get gear replacements for the, the sewing machines. That's 
them side by side. I'll put a link in the description in the description box below for you. It'll be an Amazon link because I'm an Amazon affiliate. It doesn't cost you any extra than the price of the item, um, but I do get a little bit of a commission and it does help me out. So if you do use the link, I appreciate it, but there's no obligation. You don't have to. You could actually just Google sewing machine gears and you'll find these for yourselves. The great thing about modern sewing machine plastic gears is that the, the actual plastic that they use tends to last a lot longer than 1970s plastic. Now while most manufacturers that survived the 70s were allowed to forget the decade and all the bad parts about it and move on to greater things like Brother and Janome for instance, customers have never really let Singer forget those dark and dismal days of the plastic revolution. Or should that be devolution? Many, particularly collectors, don't recognise these machines as vintage. Um, there's two reasons for that. The first one, they're beyond the post 1960s decade and it's only the ones from before the 60s that seem to be the golden age of Singer. Another reason is because of the plastic contents. Um, there are even more people, not necessarily collectors, um, that won't buy a Singer because of the experiences they had with Singer sewing machines from the 70s and the amount of trouble they had with the plastic continually breaking. But is this touch and sew and others like it really that bad? This range of sewing machines had the potential to be groundbreaking and innovative. But to me, it feels like Singer came up with some ideas, handed them to designers or maybe even engineers who probably couldn't or didn't sew. And they then handed the plans to the production team who looked at them and thought, that's gonna cost us, can we do this any cheaper? Now I'm not saying that that's what happened, it's just that's how it feels like to me. And why do I think that? Well, the reason why I think that is because this machine is clunky. It's cheap. Some of the features weren't particularly well thought out. It's confusing to use, particularly if you've got people coming from the old cast iron machines straight to this. This machine, the touch and sew range, had the potential to be the next best thing since the Singer 15, the benchmark that all modern day sewing machines are based on. But because of shortcuts and cheap components, the touch and sew never really got beyond mediocre at best. What you're looking at here, this machine and others like it, machines from the 1970s were the start of the end of Singer's dominance in the sewing machine market as well as damaging to their reputation. What is it, 40 years later? That's a reputation that's still a little bruised. Although they might just be coming back from the shadows. The Singer Quantum Stylist 9960, this one, might just change it for them. It's regularly appearing on the best sewing machine um, lists, particularly for 2020 and 2021. It's a function packed machine for the money. It's got 600 built in stitches, including 13 one step buttonholes and five alphanumeric fonts. 850 stitches a minute is fast enough to get your project sorted out, but not so fast that it's gonna run away with you. It's ideal for beginners and even more experienced sewists will be totally in awe about the features that, that you can get on this machine for the price that it's available for. I'll put a link in the description box. Again, it's an Amazon link. Um, it won't cost you anything extra, but you know, if you do use the link, I can buy chocolate. I hope you liked today's video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. Why don't you check out some of my other videos on the channel by checking out these links that will be coming up any minute now, or even check out the links that are in the description box. Click that little bell just down below and YouTube will send you a handy notification when I upload another video. 
and let me know in the comments if you've got a singer or if you've ever used a touch and sew and what you thought about it. Um, keep it clean. Whatever video you check out next, I hope to see you back here for the next one. In the meantime, whatever you're sewing, whatever you're sewing with, embrace your creativity and have fun. Thank you ever so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.